sure it's a big part of it. And those monsters are a big part of it too, but that's not the whole genre. Horror fans are very indiscriminate in their tastes. They're hugely indiscriminate. They will hate the idea of Michael Myers returning for the fifth time, but they'll go and watch it. In Canada, we've had some sequels, Prom Night 1, 2, 3, and 4, but there's really nothing connecting the two to 3 to 4 except the title. I mean, Prom Night 4, the kids don't even go to a prom. They're in a limousine, and they drive past the prom, and they go to a house in the country for a weekend of fun. Couldn't they have at least gone to the prom? It's like ridiculous. Canadian horror got pretty diluted in the 80s and 90s because it just got more, the video boom came out and there were suddenly a lot more of these movies being made for a lot less money and they were trying even harder to be American. There's a few interesting Canadian slashers. Um, prom Night obviously is probably the, the crowd favorite, although, although not a personal favorite. Um, it's, it's generally the one that people think of when, when you talk about a Canadian horror film. And, and people do recognize that as a Canadian horror film. My personal favorite has to be My Bloody Valentine, shot in the Maritimes. A very, very Canadian film, right down to the scenery. Again, there's that kind of lack of morality you find in, in American films. Any character really could, could die in that, in that film. And it, it kind of touches on some other Canadian aspects too. Um, the, the joblessness, living life in, the, in a kind of a, in a mining town or a, or a blue collar town. My, My Bloody Valentine is definitely a film that, uh, that, that needs to have uh, more people watch it, I think, uh, and realize that it is Canadian when they are watching it. Don't say I didn't warn. They also drink a, about a swimming pool full of moose head and just as the movie goes on, Moosehead beer uh, is always being drunk. There's big neon Moosehead beer signs. Whenever someone has to carry something around, they put it into a Moosehead beer box to carry it. So it's like the longest ad for Moosehead ever. My Bloody Valentine has a huge cult following and, and all over the world, not just in Canada. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you. In the 1980s, a lot more stuff went direct to video. You know, you had things like Rock and Roll Nightmare starring Thor, you know, that, that you could make really cheaply. And I think that the, the, the beauty of those early days of home entertainment, you know, this is long before DVDs, you know, and videos were unique and people would rent anything. That's the kind of thing. You go to the video stores, and now, you know, we're used to the, having these big mega stores where there's a new release rack in the front, and then there's, you know, archival stuff, rows and rows and rows, there's thousands of movies to choose from. It wasn't always like that. Home video, in a lot of ways, kind of replaced the drive-ins, you know? And um, so you had these just awful movies that would go directly to the video stores. But you know what? Kind of fun on a Friday night if you were sitting around with a pizza and a case of beer. <laughs> battle with me again. I am bound by this law to strike you from this place. It's my job. It was the late 80s, the video market was brand new and booming, and what they really wanted was uh, horror movies, sex movies, and action movies. Any of those three things, as long as the film was in focus, they'd buy it. So. <laughs> There are rules of uh, taste and morality and aesthetics that you just shouldn't break in order to make a mainstream movie. Well, you can break those in outlaw cinema. You can electrocute a naked girl in a bathtub in Psycho Girls, you know? I'm, I'm, I still shudder when I think that I did that, but you can do things because there's no studio system, there's no huge amounts of money saying, just hold it within these particular bounds. The father of one of my partners was a retired film distributor. He was going down to Los Angeles on a vacation. So he said, if you give me a cassette of the, of the movie, I'll see if I can sell it. <laughs> 24 hours later, while we're still cutting, we get this phone call and he says, I'm in the offices of uh, Glenn and Globus and they want to buy the film. How much do you want for it? So he did a really quick calculation. 
we realized that if we paid everybody back, everybody, that would be $150,000. So I said, okay, how about two? And I heard yelling and screaming in the background and everything, and after a minute he comes back and he says, okay, they'll pay you two, but that's it, no residuals, buyout, go away, goodbye. And I said, that's fine. So we looked at each other and we thought, wow, the film business is easy. <laughs> of course, it never happened like that again. So pretty. But they're going to have to come out. To me, pulling out the toenails is, like, is, like, is, is more horrifying than you know, taking a meat cleaver and hacking somebody up head to toe. What you've got is like a fantastically big and expensive special effect that'll make the audience go, wow, what a big special, special effect, that's cool. But my thinking is, is what really gets me? And what really gets me is if I were to see somebody, I don't know, in an elevator beside me, and you know, like picking off a half, a half broken off scab, and they were just picking at it, I know what that feels like, and I would just, I would be shuddering. So to have somebody torturing somebody by pulling out their toenails, I mean, uh, 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 let's face it, when it's all over, you're still alive, but the uh, pain and the suffering, I think, by, by making it very small and focused, that's much more horrifying. Give me my money. Oh shit, this dude's alive. Fucking monster. Well, that's when I came across the harsh reality of what the film business is, uh, is all about. That film was produced by a couple of um, uh, New York Wall Street types. I guess basically nice guys. And they came to Toronto and said, we want to get into the film business. We hear things are cheap in Canada. Can you point us to some hot young filmmaker? So this guy pointed out me and said, hook up with him, he'll make you a movie. So they saw Psycho Girls and they said, that's great, let's, what do you got? And I said, I actually have the vampire film that I've, I've written. And they, uh, they read it, they liked it, and they gave me the money. We shot the film. It didn't turn out well because they, uh, they decided to, to sneak the film back to New York and, uh, and recut it. It was just a terrible experience, now that I think of it. It was, a, it was, a, it was interesting to go from the first, uh, uh, the first film, that was such a perfect experience in so many levels, to the second one, which was immediately the worst thing that can happen to a filmmaker, to have your baby act actually just taken, uh, taken away from you. The first thing that's going to distinguish a Canadian horror movie is it's going to be done on the cheap. So it's going to have a look to it. It's not going to be big and glossy and blockbuster type movie. It's going to be relatively inexpensive and it's going to be innovative. <laughs> You're never going to get the innovation and the style and the look and the whole thing that comes together on a project when you are, have no money and you have to be creative and ingenious. That gives a flavor to a film that you're never going to recreate when you have, well, we'll just CGI it or we'll, we'll dub it in the studio. I mean, if you don't have those luxuries, you are forced to create something that's unique. Stan, I'd like you to meet Pim. Hello, Stan. It's nice to meet you, Pim. I didn't know you liked chocolates until just now. Thank you so much for the chocolates. Pin is Pin is a is a very creepy little film, um, and is often mentioned by people to me when I when I talk to them about Canadian horror films. It's it's one that's really stuck in people's minds um, because of the there's an anatomically correct doll who who uh, has a has a voice and uh, and or at least David Hewlett uh, David Hewlett's character gives him a voice and uh, it's very very creepy creepy film um, very memorable get the sack put the body in it take it to the river <laughs> 